uh, it is uh, if we uh, Simon uh, Brundrup uh, Andersen from um, Technical University of Denmark in Copenhagen will uh, have a presentation and uh, I'm not sure if the of the two presenters uh, now have panicked us but we the, the um, uh, this presentation is don't panic why we believe the Nordic can get go net CO2 negative by 2030, which is really good. So the floor is yours, Simon. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, I sort of almost got the presentation of who I was, but uh, once again, my name is Simon and I'm a master's student at the Technical University of Denmark, um, where I'm currently doing an investigation on how the Nordic countries, meaning Sweden, Denmark and Norway, can become CO2 negative by 2040. Um, you may notice the letters that says don't panic. We already got an interesting uh, or an introduction to it. Um, it's because it's supposed to be a engineering guide to a safer future. Uh, yeah, so I'll just guide you through it. As we know, the Paris Agreement, the member countries uh, agreed on lowering their emissions and through their uh, INDCs, uh, they set on plans on how to do so. However, most in, some inve investigations show that these INDCs are not ambitious enough. Um, whereas we see we, if we keep on going with these, we would have a median warming increase by 2.6 to 3.1 by uh, the next century. And um, that's why we think we can do more. Uh, em emissions need to be brought down and we need to drain or the top in order to keep this temperature uh, increase at the minimum. Um, so what I've done in my studies is that I focused on energy system modeling analysis, which is um, basically investing in the energy systems available. Uh, as we know, energy systems can be large when we consider uh, consider them. There's um, a powered heat sector and in industry sector, buildings and transport, etc., which all have an effect on this uh, on our energy system as it has a fuel input, um, but also needs heat or electricity, which could affect the system in some way. So the idea is then to investigate them and probably figure out the limitations or even potential potentials within an energy system. The um, energy system models that I or I am using right now at my uh, my thesis is the Balmoral model. Um, this one covers the power and heat sector, um, whereas the Times model uh, is another model that I'm using covers basically every sector. The main difference between them is that Balmoral is more focusing on the hourly production over a year where Times wo works with an aggregated um, average yearly production. Um, so I've used these two or we've used these two models together where uh, uh, the idea was that since Times is concluding everything, uh, all sectors, we can from that calculate our power, heat, power and district heating demands and emission bus jets, etc. And this is then fed into our Balmoral model, which compared to times, times has an exogenous input of electricity prices, etc., whereas Balmoral calculates this endogenously. And this is then fed back into our times model, which then this process then continues until uh, and sort of harmonization within our outputs is uh, achieved. And in this way, we utilize the best aspects of both the models at the same time. Um, just to clarify in regard to how it actually works within these models, um, Benoit and Times are te technical e economic uh, partial equilibrium models, meaning that they are optimization for, or they're optimizing in energy production from a uh, given demand in a regional system or a national system actually international when we're looking at both Norway, Denmark and Sweden. Um, however, if we have, for example, a production that uh, is, or we have a demand of electricity, we know we have a power plant that is producing this uh, electricity with some sort of fuel input. Uh, the way that Times and Balmoral then works with the CO2 that's produced is producing an auxiliary output from this power plant being the CO2 and this uh, number is based on an averaged number of the combustion of a specific fuel. So therefore it's very interesting to implement things such as variable uh, renewable energy sources into it, 
but also focus on new technologies such as CCS. So the focus points of the models was to take CO2 and handle it in a completely new way. At the moment it's handled just as having an accumulated CO2 in the system, but now we're actually going to take it and do something with it. Um, so Balmoral, as we said, it only covers the power, power and heat sector, where we, for example, see power plants, CHP plants and boilers as interesting points for our CCS implementation. However, also times includes uh, the industry, where it could also be interesting, interesting to look at it, for example, as we heard about in the cement production, steel production, etc. Um, just to go a bit through what the focus points, as we've already heard a bit, that we're going to have some capture at our power plant or industrial process, and that ha needs to be transported to storage locations with our, which are either sited onshore or offshore. The, um, to go a bit more, more into the technologies that I focused on in my studies was to f first going at the capture processes. We uh, already know some called the post-pre and oxyfuel combustion. The specific thing for these is that they're assumed to be able to be retrofitted onto existing power plants, um, whereas we, where they can also be implemented as, what do you say, um, new new capacities. When you build completely newly planned, it's already in, in implemented into it. And we've also looked at this new player called the chemical looping combustion, which is already implemented as an or that this is only implemented as a new investment technology. Transport-wise, I've focused on the ships and pipelines, and um, storage-wise, we focus on hydrocarbon fields and cell and aquifers. As we're looking at these countries, that's, in my perspective, the most interesting storages to look at. So to go a bit more into how the CO2 is handled in our modeling, I think, I think the easiest way was to understand it as three different storages. So we have our atmospheric storage, where CO, we see CO2 around us, um, our land storage, where CO2 is basically stored inside some biomass, and geologically, where it's stored either underground or in fossil fuels, etc. So the one that we're interested in is the atmospheric one, as it is the one that's going to affect our temperature increase. So the idea was then to put a maximum CO2 budget onto it, which basically represents the two degree, two, two degree increase in temperature. So going a bit more into how the CO2 is then created within the system, as we know from combustion fuel, we would increase our CO2 amount in our atmospheric um, system, whereas biomass, with the model considers it as being carbon neutral in the way that it it assumes that it uses biomass that has consumed as much CO2 as is releasing when it's being combusted within, for example, a district heating process or a boiler or whatever. Um, so the idea by combining it in the model with the CCS is then, for example, when we combust fossil fuels inside our power plants or what whatsoever, it removes some of the CO2 that was meant to be exposed into the atmospheric system actually just lowering or even keeping it carbon neutral, as we heard. Um, whereas if we combine it with the biomass energy, it would create a negative uh, input to our system, as it would has, should have been released, but now it's captured and put into storage. So just to go a bit over how it's, the CO2 is handled within the system, in the capture, it considers if it's retrofitted or newly installed capacity. The main difference is that the retrofit is able to emit, choose to if it wants to emit or if it wants to capture. And whereas the newly built capacity can only capture when it's producing. Um, therefore, when it chooses to capture, it has to invest in a capture technology that matches the amount that it wants to capture. The specific characteristics of the capture technology itself is based by that we see when it captures, it has some sort of capture rate. So some of the CO2 that was supposed to be captured is actually emitted, and it also has an electricity input since it needs energy in order to run this process. And this electricity input is equivalent to the 
lowering or the efficiency penalty where we see at some plants when you implement this technology. Um, assume for it is the, in the model that when the CO2 is captured from a specific process is ready for transport and that's also um, depicted in the costs, meaning investment cost and operational cost of the system. Um, transport wise, we've assumed that when you capture you have to transport it and you have to store it. So that means that you have to invest in capacity, um, what do you see, accordingly so, to what it, so it matches. Um, as I said before, we have the ship transport and, off, and the pipeline transport. The main reason for choosing this is because when we look at studies, those are the ones that are deemed most economically feasible in terms of transportation. Um, the cost related to the transportation for, for example, pipelines and ships are mostly dependent on volumes it has to transport and the distance it has to transport. Um, in terms of uh, storage, lo storage um, it's mainly dependent on how much it has to store and the maximum potential that's found within the storage. So going a bit over how we defined the specific emission, uh, emissions and distances from a specific uh, location. So for example, we have for, oh, it actually works. We have, uh, we pick a region, for example, DK1, and we see a lot of emissions around it. These emissions are then weighted into an weighted, weighted average location. And from that, that location, it's then assumed that all emissions are, what do you say, accumulated into and transported from. So that would define our emission hub. And then it's then transported to any location that's within reason of distance uh, from it. And that would then define the price or costs of our uh, transport um, technologies. Going into a bit of uh, the results that we saw when we ran the model, this one is uh, the budget-based scenario where we implemented the budget, CO2 budget into the model. Uh, and as we can see, it lowers our emissions. It also includes some stored CO2, but however, much of it comes from coal, natural gas. And the technology is used so far, it's assumed that it's just removing the CO2. It's not actually creating any negative flow within the system. So these could just be considered as removed CO2 corresponding to what you would actually expect. Um, so if I go further to a scenario, scenario favorable, or CCS favorable scenario, uh, we can see we have much more CO2 stored, and this mainly comes from bioprocesses. Um, so therefore, these can actually be considered as being negative within our system. And if we consider where our CO2 is stored, we can see mainly most of it is uh, stored in Norway, then Sweden and Denmark. Um, one of the reasons could be that Norway has a huge potential of storing CO2 since uh, outside of its, uh, its naval border or just uh, across the land border. But however, um, we also figured out that there is a very large transmission capacity from Norway to Great Britain that's being built, meaning that it, the model figured it would make economically sense for it to build power plants to capture negative CO or create negative CO2 in the model just to trans transport or ex export uh, excesses electricity to Great Britain. Um, however, if we consider what capacity is being built, we see that mainly the electricity or power heat sector is covering it. And that's mostly explained by our CSC technology. Compared to all the other technologies, this technology is actually seen as the least expensive and therefore the model thought it would make most, like, make most sense to invest mostly in this and uh, therefore we see this division. Um, just to end up with a bit of the carbon budget, so our model generated some carbon, um, carbon CO2 emissions where these represent the negative emissions in our system. And uh, the idea was then if we wanted to pay back the carbon debt that we created from 2020, uh, already in 2080, we would have to actually double the payback rate that we had in 2050 up to 2080. So the idea was, or the thing is that if you wanted to make a more sensible implementation, we would have to 
increase the incentives in order to be able to invest in this technology more to implement it earlier so we wouldn't see this large uh, payback rate or increment if of carbon. Um, so why do we believe it? Mostly because, or first thing is that we, we are, I was able, we were able to model the capturing of CO2 transportation and storaging within the energy system model. So therefore we could see the costs uh, related to it both on expenses and load wise. Um, we also made it able to implement the technology onto existing uh, conventional technologies so where it doesn't really or doesn't, uh, didn't really seem to be able to lower the emissions such as cement production. And at the moment it's the only option of gaining a negative emission flow in our system. So yeah, that's it.